Monterey Public Library for hosting this event. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce to everybody Tim Thomas, who's going to be um, presenting on canners and fishermen working on Cannery Row. Tim is a fisheries historian and he worked as a historian at the Monterey Maritime Museum for 15 years. So we're really lucky to have him here today. Um, Tim's going to speak for about a half an hour or so and then we're going to open up to uh, Q&A. And as Francesca mentioned, um, once we open up to Q&A, you'll be able to type questions in or you can raise your hand and you'll be able to ask Tim directly. All right, Tim, I'm going to pass it over to you. Thank you. So how do we get rid of this part? Ah. All right, so I hope all of you can hear me. Uh, welcome to our second annual Cannero Days. Um, last year, we were, of course, able to actually meet down there on Cannery Row, and hopefully next year, we'll, we'll be able to do that again. Um, as Emily mentioned, I, I plan to go for about 30 minutes, but I have to be honest, I have a tendency to just go on and on and on. And so when you've had enough of this, you can just say, hey, man, we have had enough of this. And you won't hurt my feelings, I promise. Um, we really have questions, uh, and please feel free to ask. Uh, I did put my email address down here. It's very easy to remember. In case you don't get to your question, please feel free to email me at any time, and uh, I will try to answer your question, I promise. All right, so let's see what we can do here. So here's why we're here today, actually, this whole event to talk about Canterbury Row. Not just the novel Canterbury Row, but real Canterbury Row. Uh, of course, this is the 75th anniversary of the publication of Canary Row. And I noticed today, this is an early publication, uh, paperback publication of the novel. I don't know if it's the first publication cover, but it's one of the early ones. And I noticed up there, it was 75. So it must mean something. But, uh, 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 but I wanted to uh, mention a couple things about the book Canary Row, because the truth is, it's not really about cannery row. It's not about cannery workers or starting fishermen. Um, and in fact, I believe this book really could take place almost anywhere because uh, it's really about connections and how everything is connected and how, sort of my philosophy of life, how everything is connected and, and sort of about friendship and things like that. Um, but he did write some. And I just, I'm going to read you just from the very beginning of the book what he did write about cannery workers. In the morning, when the starting fleet has made a catch, the purse sailors waddle heavily into the bay, blowing their whistles. The deep laden boats pull in against the coast where the canneries dip their tails into the bay. The figure is advisedly chosen for if the canneries dip their mouths into the bay, the canned sardines, which emerge from the other end, would be metaphorically at least even more horrifying. Then cannery whistles scream and all over the town, men and women scramble into their clothes and come running down to the row to go to work. Then shining cars bring the upper classes down, superintendents, accountants, owners who disappear into offices. Then from the town pour Wops, Chinamen, and, Polk and Polak, men and women in trousers and rubber boots and coats and oil cloth, oil cloth aprons that come running to clean and cut and pack and cook and can the fish. The whole street rumbles and groans and screams and rattles while the silver rivers of fish pour in out of the boat and the boats rise higher and higher in the water until they are empty. The canneries rumble and rattle and squeak until that last fish is cleaned and cut and cooked and canned. And then the whistles scream again and the dripping, smelly, tired wops, Chinamen and Polacks, men and women, straggle out and droop their ways up the hill into the town and Cannero becomes itself again, quiet and magical. So that's what Steinbeck wrote about these folks right here. So this is a group, wonderful photograph of cannery workers. The book takes place, well, well the book was written in 1944, I know and published in 1945, uh, but it takes place during the depression, about 1935 when this photograph was taken of cannery workers. And if you look, you can see the woman here in her, in her cannery workers uh, uniform here. And the guy here, he's got his rubber boots on uh, right here. This was probably taken in the morning and they're waiting to go in to go to work there. So, so Cannery Row, where does the name Cannery Row actually come from? I don't know, why do I get this picture here of all these people? 
let's get that. Whoop, sorry. So I, I'm not seeing my pictures of everything. No, 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 no. Hang on. Can someone help me? You can go ahead and um, share your screen again. I, I did. It's, 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 it's just behind all this stuff here. Uh, the name Cairo, most of you probably already know this, but the name Cannery Road, that's, well, that street wasn't always Cannery Road. In fact, that street did not officially become Cannery Row until 1958, when the city of Monterey decided we should change the name to Cannery Road as a way to attract tourism down to that part of Monterey. Uh, um, the name does not come from John Steinbeck's novel either. In fact, that street was always referred to as Cannery Row. I actually research, researched this and uh, the earliest reference that I can find to it being called Cannery Row appears in a, a local newspaper uh, in 1919, uh, where they called, referred to the street as Cannery Row. Unfortunately, we don't know who that writer was that called it Cannery Row, because uh, in those days, the writers just didn't get bylines, uh, but uh, it was always referred to as Cannery Row down there. Uh, but we have to back it up. So it wasn't, the Cannery Row, of course, was all about sardines, but it doesn't start with sardines. It really starts with salmon. Salmon was king. Salmon was the big fishery in Monterey, California at the turn of the 20th century. Uh, and that's what attracted a lot of people to Monterey, that's attracted canners to come to Monterey. Uh, and the fact is, it, and it wasn't Italian fishermen who were doing this, it was actually tourists and Japanese fishermen. This is actually a, a guy named Jay Parker Whitney here. Mr. Whitney was an interesting gentleman. He's a guy that, that uh, he was a pretty wealthy guy. In fact, he and his two brothers uh, came to California from the Massachusetts area uh, during the California gold rush and made a lot of money uh, in selling supplies to gold miners. And they also raised a special breed of sheep. By the time Mr. Whitney was about 30, he was actually a a millionaire. So he spent the rest of his life just traveling the world, doing the things that he loved, which was hunting and fishing. And he used to come to Monterey quite a bit, staying at the Hotel Del Monte, fishing salmon out in the bay out there. And it was Mr. Whitney who introduced the idea of fishing salmon that day with a rod and reel, which you can see here, and fishing salmon uh, in the bay uh, with a trolling line, which line with a lot of hooks on it, which you drag to your through the bay uh, behind your boat, which also a really effective way to catch salmon out in the bay out there. And, and so they began to make large salmon landing into the Monterey Bay, uh, which caught the attention of a guy named Frank Booth, who was in the Santa business up along the Sacramento River. Uh, as Booth came down to Monterey before the turn of the 20th century and said, oh man, this is great. And they tried to get contracts from the then arriving Japanese fishermen. Japanese fishermen began arriving in the 1890s uh, to fish for abalone and to fish for salmon. And they actually were the, they actually ruled that bay in terms of fishing. Uh, in fact, to give you an idea of how large that industry was for the Japanese in 1909, at the end of that 1909 salmon season, which lasted about three months, uh, the Monterey Daily Cypress, which was a local newspaper at that time, reported at the end of that 1909 salmon season, there were 185 salmon boats working in Monterey Bay, 145 of them were Japanese owned, and they're catching an average of a million pounds of king salmon in three months. A million! That is a lot of fish. That 1909 salmon season, they caught 1,500,000 pounds of king salmon in the Monterey Bay. As I mentioned, I got the attention of, uh, of Mr. Booth, who came down to Monterey and tried to get those contracts of Japanese fishermen. He said, oh, we already have good contracts in the market in San Francisco. So he backed off a little bit and built a little shed up behind the Monterey, up near the Monterey Wharf. This is a picture of a guy named Manuel Duarte and his store, the Marine Museum, sort of the first aquarium, maritime museum uh, in Monterey. He was, a, you can see the abalone shells up here, and uh, he was a taxidermist. He was a whalebone products right down here. Uh, this is a whalebone vertebrae with the Carmel Mission painted on it. Here's a whalebone chair you see right here. I've actually sat in this chair. It's not very comfortable. He was a taxidermist and he was uh, selling whalebone book covers with little pieces of seaweed 
and the pages uh, pressed all through it. But he was also working with the Monterey commercial fishermen at that time because they weren't making a lot of money uh, to order to make ends meet. And they would hire themselves out to the sport fishermen like Jay Parker Whitney, and they'd take them out in the bay and show them the good places to fish for salmon. They acted as salmon guides, uh, as fishing guides, like they would do in Europe. And they saw uh, Mr. Whitney was fishing salmon with that rod and reel and those trolling lines. And they said, hey, hey, we can do that. And I have salmon landing records to go back to that time, and you actually can see it. In 1893, they caught maybe 5,000 pounds with the salmon. Then they switched to trolling uh, technology. In 1895, they caught over 95,000 pounds with the salmon, which gets the attention of Mr. Boo. Uh, here's our Japanese salmon fishermen unloading their salmon at the Monterey Wharf. Uh, about not, about uh, about 1909. So in between that time, uh, as I mentioned, Booth comes opens that builds a little shed about 1900 uh, near the Monterey Wharf in what's now Heritage Harbor. In between that time, the city of Monterey leases a piece of property right next to the wharf to a man named H.R. Robbins. And Mr. Robbins was actually in the cereal business up in Oakland, California. And he wanted to branch out, come and open up a reduction process. We'd come down with reduction is the process we're taking the heads, tails, and offal of the fish and grinding it up for other products, animal feed, fertilizer, that kind of thing. He knew they were catching all the fish in Monterey. He do, knew they were discarding all the offal. He figured I can use that stuff. Uh, so he leases this piece of property uh, next to the wharf. And I've seen Mr. Robbins lease. The city of Monterey actually still has the lease. And it says on his lease, for the purposes of sardine cannery, reduction plant, dance hall. He also sold sea lions to the circuses. He used to say that Mr. Robbins was not the greatest businessman. And Mr. Booth bought him out in 1903. And he did get the contracts of Japanese fishermen and began to, began to can salmon as his big fishery and then began to experiment. This is Mr. Booth right here. And began to experiment with these large sardines that are appearing in the bay at the turn, uh, at the end of the salmon season. So let's talk about sardines for a minute. So sardine really is kind of a generic word. Almost all small silvery fish are referred to as a sardine. At the turn of the 20th century in the United States, people in this country ate sardines almost on a daily basis. Kind of like we eat crackers or potato chips today, people ate sardines. They loved them. But the sardines they were eating were not sardines coming from the West Coast. But those sardines are coming from the North Atlantic, those little guys, coming primarily from France. France was a big sardine producer at the turn of the 20th century. Those are the sardines they all wanted. Uh, and so Booth thought they could do something with these larger sardines. We began to experiment with these guys. In fact, uh, another guy he brought in at the same time was uh, this guy. This is a guy named Newt Hogden. Uh, Hogden was Norwegian uh, who uh, came to Monterey in 1906 and worked as a manager for, uh, for Booth managed his cannery here in Monterey. And if something will remind me at, at, the, at the end of this talk or bring up Mr. Booth or, Mr. or asking about Hogan, I will talk more about him. I won't do it right now because it'll just take up too much time, but he does have a very interesting story to tell, uh, he does. So <clears throat> this is Booth's cannery uh, that was at the Monterey Wharf so if you know Monterey, over here it would be the Heritage Harbor. And this picture was taken about 1906, about the time the Hogan came in to go to work for him. In those days, everything was pretty much done by hand. So the boats come in, they pull the fish off the boat with these big baskets, they walk them up behind the cannery here to lay them on these racks to dry, and they'll walk them into the cannery where they then hand by hand uh, cut off their heads and tails, and then they'll gut the fish, they'll take out all the offal, and then they'll walk them through the canning process to the point where they're actually hand soldering every can. It was a very, very slow process. So Hoden actually introduced a lot of new technology. He introduced this idea of new commercial dryers and sealing machines and, and really speed up the process. One of the things he tried that didn't work out quite so well, but one of my very favorite things 
is he had this idea of putting floating pins right in the middle of the Monterey Harbor. So the idea being the fishermen to come up to these floating pins, drop their catch in there, then the fish would stay alive in these floating pens. So when they needed fresh fish, they just go get them so they could can them. Uh, well, that, uh, could you imagine all those seals and sea lions and pelicans? Now that only lasted about a season. All right, so uh, here's the racks of drying sardines. This is also a booth sardine cannery. This is very early 1906 or 1907. You see it right there. And then this is probably the earliest label for Monterey sardines. Uh, this is from 1903 uh, from the Booth Sardine Cannery. Uh, and you can see, of course, the mission right here. And then I love the palm trees that you see right here. But this is a very, very early label process for those sardines. But he was making his money, <clears throat> as I mentioned, really in the salmon business. And he was making his money in the fresh fish, fresh fish business. Uh, but the fresh fish they were bringing in were rockfish mainly. Uh, that market wasn't here in Monterey. That market was in San Francisco. Uh, believe it or not, people in Monterey at that time really didn't eat a lot of fresh fish. I mean, they ate some, uh, but they didn't eat a lot of it. Uh, it was Chinese fishermen who would establish themselves here in the 1850s who were selling fresh fish to the local citizens in Monterey and early on, and then fish markets. There was a couple of, the Duarte family had a fish market, uh, but the real money for big fresh, fresh fish at that time really was in the big markets in San Francisco, but it was difficult uh, before 1874 to get fresh fish to the markets because the railroad had to ride in Monterey. Yeah. So the Monterey sardine was never a popular fish to eat. Uh, people just thought it was too oily. The money never was ever in the canned product. This is the first ad for Monterey sardines. It appears in a Sears and Roebuck catalog here in 1905. You can see down here, souse, those are pickling slices, broiled mackerel. So they're selling these fish as Monterey mackerel. But even in 1905, the federal government said, uh-uh, you can't call those mackerel because they're not mackerel. Those are sardines. So they market these fish initially to the African-American communities as salmon sardines, and they market them to the Jewish communities as herring sardines. They tried a variety of different things to sell these fish. They used to produce these beautiful recipe books like this one right here. And you go down to the cannery and they would give you one or they would mail you one. Or in those days, you bought canned products, you usually bought them by the case. They put one in the case. It has all these wonderful recipes for sardine sandwiches and sardine sandwiches and sardine uh, rare a bit. And, and my favorite is actually a sardine balls, which actually was just sort of crushed up sardine that were rolled and cooked in cracker crumbs. Uh, and my favorite though is a sardine jello and salad that was made with lime jello, chili sauce, and Monterey sardines, which I've actually tried a few times. It's actually not that bad. Uh, this is another recipe book that I cover. I love this one, sort of die cut. Looks like a can of sardines back there. And here's an ad for from the booth uh, sardine can sardines trying to sell us to the Jewish community uh, for your Lenten menus. Is of course the Monterey sardine right there. So another player in your story is this guy right here. This is a guy named uh, uh, Otto Sabarunoda. The guy behind him here is Janoske Kadani. Uh, Kadani came to Monterey uh, to work in the Abilene industry. Really, two of these men really established the Abilene industry in Monterey. But Noda came to Monterey in the mid 1890s, uh, got a job working for the land arm of the Southern Pacific Railroad, the Pacific Improvement Company. Noda saw got a job working uh, kind of as a, uh, as a lumberjack and he was up in a tree near the Monterey Wharf one day and looked down into the harbor and just saw all this abalone down there. In fact, so much abalone, he literally described it in a leather as being a carpet of abalone and nobody was doing anything with it. And the reason nobody was doing anything with it because nobody knew what the heck he was supposed to do with it. Notasan knew what to do with it. So he writes letter back to government of Japan and said, hey, all this abalone here, nobody wants it. The government of Japan sends Janosuke Kidani, who comes over and develops an abalone fishery here. Between that time, Noda leases a piece of property on present day Cannery Row, this property right here, and sends back to the Wakayama Prefecture of Japan for other fishermen to come and begin to fish salmon and abalone in Monterey Bay. And then in that, this is that piece of property. If you know Cannery Row, by the way, here's the 
here is the El Torito restaurant here, and their plan is to build a marketplace here. That's the plan someday to do that. Uh, but he leased this piece of property. And in 1902, he worked with a guy named Harry Malpas. Harry Malpas was an American who was in the canning business. But Harry Malpas was the manager of the Point Lobos Canning Company. The two of them partnered up, and they built the very first cannery on present-day Cannery Row called the Monterey Fishing and Canning Company. And this is the very first cannery on Cannery Row. This is a label for their cannery right here. They only operated from between 1902 and 1907. So for six years, uh, they operated. This is, not, but I love this, uh, a true sardine, which I think was a marketing ploy to sell that large sardine. Uh, but the very first cannery on what we now call Cannery Row uh, actually was mostly Japanese owned at that time. But a number of these Japanese uh, workers, so one of the things that uh, Steinbeck, when he talked about those workers, which I like is that those canneries were, 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 I like to say, were a multicultural stew. Uh, if you had a warm body, you could go to work in these canneries. Everybody worked in them if you needed a job. Uh, it, there were, uh, of course, uh, there were a lot of Spanish speakers. Uh, there were uh, Chinese workers. There were, Span there were Japanese workers. Uh, there were uh, African-American workers in these canneries. Uh, there were a number of different people that worked in these canneries. Uh, uh, they, uh, they all had different kinds of jobs. There was a hierarchy in these calories. Uh, with, uh, early on, when things were done by hand, the Asian workers, for the most part, had the higher end jobs. They were the fish cutters. It took a certain skill to cut the heads and tails off those fish. They actually usually made more money uh, than they did than the other workers in the canneries. Uh, there was, you should know, no union in these canneries until 1938. Uh, and so there was no real pay consistency in the, within these canneries. Uh, uh, but there were a lot of Japanese workers uh, in the canneries in 19, uh, at the turn of the 20th century. I bring this up because, as I'm sure most of you are aware, uh, at the turn of the 20th century, there was an anti-Japanese sentiment in the United States, coming primarily from uh, Caucasian workers, white workers were convinced that the Japanese were coming to take their job, which really wasn't the case. But in 1905, Mr. Booth, thinking he was going to be politically, politically correct, said to the local newspaper, I'm not gonna hire any more Japanese, which really was an easy call for him because he didn't really mean it. He was still gonna buy Santa for them and, and he was also gonna hire them to continue to work in his cannery. But it was that instant he sent for these Sicilian fishermen who already worked for him up along the Sacramento River fishing salmon to come down here to Monterey to begin fishing sardine here as a small secondary fishery in the fall and winter months. Salmon was king. Salmon was a big fishery in Monterey, as I brought up, but, but the, this was to fill in those months. Uh, this wonderful photograph of a proud Sicilian fisherman and his three daughters on his brand new Lampara boat on Pari first the type of netting that they used. And so when these Sicilian fishermen first came to Monterey, uh, these guys weren't schooling fish fishermen at that time. They weren't really sure how to do it, but they remembered when they lived in Sicily, you'd sail across the bay in, into Tangiers where these African fishermen did use fish schooling fish. And they used a type of net, for, special type of net for that. So somebody here in Monterey, writes the letter back to Sicily, said, go and get us that net, which they did. And they sent it to Monterey and they built it on the porch of the Monterey Custom House. They called it a lampara, which means lightning in Sicilian, and began to fish sardine in, in Monterey Bay. This wonderful fish, a photograph of early Sicilian fishermen fishing sardine in the middle of Monterey Bay a Harbor right here. These are all Sicilian fishermen here. Uh, you see the net right here, a net full of fish. This guy right here, his name is Piatto Ferrante. He's responsible for all these Sicilian fishermen coming here to Monterey. Uh, and how this net operates, it's got lead weights on the bottom. It's got glass floats on the top here. So a good captain like Piatto Ferrante knows that if you take care of your crew, your crew will take care of you. So this is what he would use to float those nets. He'd use these glass bottles. If you can see this glass bottom bottle actually has a rounded bottom on it. In those days, if you stood upright, the carbonation in the bottle would pop the cork. So it's on its side, it wouldn't have that problem. So he'd use these bottles, fill these bottles with beer, use them to float his nets in the cold water of the Monterey Bay, they're done fishing, they pull off the floats, 
Everybody had cold beer. Pretty smart. Here's a wonderful photograph. Uh, this is a fisherman, uh, mostly Japanese fishermen actually, uh, uh, on uh, drawing their nets and repairing their nets. This is right along the Monterey waterfront. This is actually today the, where the Monterey Small Craft Harbor is. This is the wharf where no, wharf number two is today. Then it was the Southern Pacific Railroad Wharf, also known as the Japanese Wharf, because Japanese fishermen used to work off that wharf. And this wooden boardwalk you see right here was probably at Hotel Del Monte. And the Hotel Del Monte, when they built the hotel, built this beautiful wooden boardwalk that wrapped itself all the way on the Monterey waterfront from the hotel right to the Monterey Wharf, where they had all kinds of wonderful glass on boat rides and different kinds of things for the guests at the hotel. So uh, this is a wonderful photograph of the uh, Monterey exhibit at the 1915 Panama Pacific International Exposition World's Fair held in San Francisco. Uh, it was a World's Fair to honor the opening of the Panama Canal. It opened a couple of years before. And at that time, World's Fairs were very special things. And all, every state was represented and all kinds of new products were introduced at this World's Fair. And California had the largest of the state buildings. Uh, Monterey County, every county is represented, and Monterey County had the largest of the state, the uh, largest of the exhibits in California State Building. This is Monterey County, part of it. You can see all of the abalone shell and the seat and the fish exhibit here. And the, oh, I love the uh, abalone diver. This is from the Point Lobos Canning Company exhibit you see right here. Uh, but also, uh, what was introduced at that World's Fair? Monterey sardines. This is a business card from the Booth Sardine Company that I actually found on eBay many years ago. And, and I saw the card on eBay. And eBay, by the way, was the museum curator's best friend. Uh, at least it was in those days. Uh, we found things that you thought you would never see. And I saw this card and I said, gee, look, a Booth Sardine card. But it had writing on it. You couldn't really read it from the, my computer at that time. And, and so I went ahead and I bought the card. And when I got it, I, I could see it, read it. It says, near U.S. Fisheries Food Products Building Exposition. So this is from the 1915 Panama Pacific, where they introduced Monterey sardines to the world. But the truth is, the Monterey sardine wasn't all that popular. And as I mentioned, all the, all the money was going, uh, all the money was in sand. And, uh, but eventually that sardine fishery will become the largest fishery, a single fish in the history of the United States. Well, how does that happen? Well, let's take a look here. This happens. There's another ad for the Booth Sardine Cannery in peace or war, Booth Sardine. This is from about 1918. World War One. Well, all that salmon, about 90% of it actually was going to Europe, going mainly to Germany. And as I mentioned, all the sardines are eating this country, coming from Europe, coming primarily from France. And what happens again in the world in 1914? World War One. It cuts off all that uh, salmon going to Europe, all those sardines coming from Europe, and they just switch and begin to heavily fish sardine along the west coast here. There were sardine canneries in New York State and Maine, but those guys couldn't fish because there were German submarines out there in the Atlantic. And so they began to heavily fish sardine here in Monterey Bay. So here's one of my favorite uh, favorite labels, also around that time. This was before Prohibition. I love this label. Uh, real treat booths broiled sardines. So initially, all the, I love the beer, right? Beer, beer and sardines. What goes better? Uh, broiled sardines. So, so originally, all those sardines were cooked in hot oil, pea oil or olive oil. It's it's called the French method. So that's where French fries come from, right? That's how they're initially cooking them. But uh, because of problems with the hot oil, it would sometimes cause fires. Uh, they began to steam them. Uh, the steam was a better process. And, and so they brought in big boilers. And, and eventually, steam took over. And steam not only cooked the sardines, but ran all the machinery within the cannery. Plus, the food tasted better. The sardines were a much better product. Uh, but as I mentioned, the real money was never in the canned product. The real money was always in the byproducts. So the real time the commodity sardine can has really made money in the canned food as sardines in the canned product really was during the World War I years. Once this World War I ends in 1918 and 1919 and the, and the Atlantic markets begin to reopen for sardines and those little sardines begin to reappear and then they stopped buying the California sardine. And so the canneries 
began to focus mainly on the reduction process. But take the head, tails, and all, all kinds of whole fish and growing up other products, animal feed, fertilizer, that kind of thing. This is a label uh, for chicken feed. That's where the big money was, in chicken feed. So next time you guys all go to the market and buy a chicken for dinner, you can thank the Monterey Sardine for that chicken. Because prior to 1920, the chicken industry in California was not doing very well. People did not eat chicken like we do today. It was kind of expensive. They began to produce this cheap chicken feed out of the head, tails, the opal, the Monterey Sardines. The chickens loved it, thrived on it. More and more chickens were being produced. The price of chicken went down. People began to buy chickens. My friend Bill Ripley, a retired biologist, used to say, the foster farm chicken owes its life to the bones of the Monterey sardine. Absolutely true. Of course, Monterey Cannon Company, this is a beautiful photograph uh, uh, of the Monterey Cannon Company opened about 1917 uh, during those war years when they were really being developed. So how does Cannon Row become Cannery Row? This is a perfect example. So when the war breaks out and the begin demand for a sardines from the West Coast. Blueprints are drawn up, plans are made to build canneries all on the Monterey waterfront, starting about where wharf number two is. Well, the folks at the Hotel Del Monte, who had a lot of political power here in Monterey, were very, very unhappy with this idea. They were convinced if you got sardine canners along the waterfront, then the tourists wouldn't come to Monterey. So they actually passed these petitions around to try to stop this fishery, but even developing here in Monterey. But the city of Monterey said, wait a minute, there's money to be made here. Said, all right, all you sardine canners can go way down there at the end of Ocean View Avenue where nobody goes. And Mr. Booth could stay where he was because he was already, canners already there. And that's how Canner Row becomes Cannery Row. Uh, but notice how they built this. So this is what they call mission style architecture. So it just wasn't a straight industrial style building. They actually thought about how it would blend in to the community, how it blend into the peninsula, and built this beautiful little building that you see right here. Of course, this building burned down two or three times actually over the years. Anybody down on Cannon Row, and you'd see that the warehouse from Monterey Cannon Company, the beautiful red corrugated building that's there, that's the warehouse from Monterey Cannon Company. Yeah, and this belonged to A.M. Allen, by the way. A.M. Allen uh, owned Point Lobos at the time. It, Point Lobos exists today because of A.M. Allen. He's the guy that preserved it. He also worked with Genosuke Kodani in the Avalon business. He was Kodani's partner. He was a pretty progressive thinker for its time. Uh, again, these are workers uh, from early canning companies. This is Carmel Canning, about 1916 or 1917. Uh, I love this photograph. Again, as I mentioned, a multicultural stew. You'll see Asian workers here. You'll see Spanish workers here. Uh, look at the picture closely. You'll see the aprons. These are made out of newspapers that you see right here. And these two ladies here are probably a mother and daughter holding hands right here. But what's really interesting to me about this photograph actually is what you don't see here. And what you don't see here are African-Americans. And I know there are a number of African-Americans who worked in these canneries. I know that from census records, but you rarely see them in these photographs here. And I don't know why that is. So again, yeah. I know. Tim, I'm going to jump in for a second. Um, so just to make sure we've got time for questions. So maybe yeah. about five minutes. Yeah, we're getting there. Perfect. Thank you. So again, this is inside cannery. These are uh, all mostly all Asian workers. These are fish cutters. Uh, I love this photograph. Uh, the guy's got a great tattoo you see right here. Uh, these are all fish cutters. Again, that took a certain skill to do that. Uh, uh, to, 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 um, it was a, a Japanese fish cutters. Uh, who in 1920 actually went on strike in Cannery Row, on Cannery Row because uh, there was an uh, inconsistency in terms of pay. Uh, and so uh, they wanted to know why their best friend, Hayoto, down the street at San Xavier Cannery was making more money than he was making over there at Holden's Cannery. And the can owner said, that's just too bad. And so they actually went on strike and literally shut the street down for a week. And so the can owners tried all kinds of different things to get workers to come in and replace these fish cutters. Uh, they tried, uh, they put ads in the paper and they thought, well, housewives, they cut fish at home, they could do it. Well, that didn't work out too well. And so they actually ended up going to the Japanese fishermen, the, the can owners did, and they said, unless you guys stop this strike, we're not going to buy any fish from you. And so they actually fished, uh, the fishermen went to those county workers and said, you guys got to stop this or none of us are going to eat. And so they did. 
But the result of this strike in 1920 was that, uh, that uh, none of the Japanese workers were hired back for that 1920-21 sardine season, and uh, Filipino workers were brought in to replace them, begin to work in the canneries there. Uh, real quickly, this is, a, this is before there was a union in these canneries here. Uh, this was a, a, time, a time card for a worker named Dorothy Wheeler. This is from October of 1936. Dorothy worked at the Holden Cannery. And if you look at the time card, Dan, they wrote eight hours, five days a week. Now, we know that she worked 10 hours, 12 hours, sometimes even 15 hours, because you wouldn't go home until you put all the fish up in those canneries. But let's take a look at the close up here. If you look at the card closely, look down here. She actually worked a sixth day, but they wrote it in pencil and then they erased it because it was illegal to do that. And she also made $19.23 for that six day work week that she put in there. Then in 1938, the AFL came in and, and unionized all these workers, uh, all these county workers, although they still weren't making all that much money, but they were getting some, they were making a little bit more. There was little safety precautions were brought in, other kinds of things. In 1939, the CIO, which was a separate union uh, at that time, came in and began to organize workers and said, we'll get you better pay, better working conditions, and you wouldn't have to work those long hours. And so they went, and so a lot of workers signed up for that CIO, and they went to negotiate with the cannery owners, and the cannery owners said, forget it. We already dealt with those CIO, or the AFL, we're not dealing with that CIO. So anybody who signed up for that CIO are not allowed to work in the canneries for the 1939-40 season. So two weeks before Christmas, 1939, those CIO workers sent their children, here they are right here, all marching from downtown Monterey to Cannery Row, and they're carrying these signs. This sign actually says, Santa Claus can't come to my house because daddy works for the CIO. So again, a little hierarchy within the canneries. This is the canning line. Uh, this is, uh, you'll notice these are all women. Uh, majority of the labor force in these canneries were women. They had the harder the jobs in these canneries, and they also made about 15 cents an hour less than the men did. Uh, also, prior to World War II, you would never see a man working these canning lines. At the height of the depression, if there were enough women to work these lines, they shut them down. Even if there were men out on the street, they'll all go in there and do this. This was considered to be women's work. They also got paid by the piece. So usually they'll see little cards on their back. In this case, you see the cards along this line here. And once an hour or so, the lady will come, I'm called the four lady, she'll come down the line and mark these cards as to how many cans she put up in an hour. And they know how many cans will come down to her station. So when this picture was taken, these ladies were making 23 cents for every 16 cans they put up. That is illegal to do that today. This is what the men did. Uh, they worked in the boilers and they did all the sardine cooking. This is the retorts cooking all those sardines. So I'm gonna speed this up a little bit. Sardine boats, these are, this is Monterey past, present and future in the sardine fishery right here. Monterey Lampara boat you see right here. This one's known as a half ringer, a Japanese round hull. This is a purse sander, again refers to the type of netting that it used. And then these are two brand new purse sanders uh, with, the, with the turntable on it. And where they lay, the net is laid on that turntable, that it turns or they begin to lay out the net there. And you can see why this boat was an advantage because you could pull a lot of fish on this boat right here. Uh, and I've been told, by the way, that in Southern California, the turntables were turned to the right. In Monterey, the turntables turned to the left. I think that was a political thing. All right, so that is a Monterey barge uh, called a lighter that was filled with sardine. Uh, here they are unloading that little Monterey lighter right there. Uh, this, is, this is a big Monterey, this is a Lampara boat, so they don't put the sardines in the Lampara boat and pull the sparge behind them. Uh, again, that's the advantage of having that big sardine boat, the purse center, because all the boat sardines go on that boat. This could take up to 60 tons of sardine right there. And then these are fishing game scientists. Some can ask about this when we get the questions, but Ed Rickus was not the only biologist on Canary Row. These guys were, these guys are very, very important. This one in particular, whose name was Francis Clark right there. And there she is tagging sardines in Monterey right there. So known as a deck load. Uh, look, there is knee deep in sardines right there. So they already fill up the hole, but now they're filling up the deck of sardines. That boat's got 200 tons of sardine on it. Come in with a download right there. Then real quickly, again, here we are today. 
book Cannery Row. There we are right there. So tourists did not come down to Monterey, down to Cannery Row during the heyday of the sardine fishery. You didn't go down there. Why would you? It was an industrial area. It, it was dangerous. There were cars, there were trucks, there were forklifts. Uh, you smell bad. You did not go down there for that reason. Uh, until after 1945 when this book came out. Uh, and then people started to come down the Cannery Row. Uh, here's a photograph that I found. Uh, this was taken by some tourists, taken after 1945. And you can see a Wing Chong's Market you see right there. And then you can see the boilers on the side right here. Uh, and, 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 um, and then Wing Chong really made his money uh, actually in the squid business. And uh, I know I'm running out of time, so I won't go into this now, but next time I will, you can ask me about it. And then, because that's really where the money was for Wing Chun was in the, it was in the squid business. That's all dried squid there. That's called Squid Mountain. And then uh, here's another photograph of that same photographer uh, from 1945. Uh, of course, Ed Ricketts lab right there. And, and so he read the book. He down Cannery Canero taking these pictures. Ed was home that day. What if he locked up on the door? There's his car in the garage right there. And there was construction going on because the, the Yi family, Wan Yi, who was the model for Lee Chong in a book, Cannery Row, his family were building a reduction plant right there uh, next door at that time. All right, so I think I bored you guys enough. So uh, thank you very much. <laughs> All right, so I'll ask questions and I'll try to answer them. Tim, thank you. That was fantastic. Yeah, I um, see through at the end there. Sorry. I knew I had too much. No, no, that was great. The pictures are so great. Um, so we can take questions either via the chat or folks can raise their hands um, either virtually as Francesca showed you at the beginning or you can raise your real hands and I will see you here. Okay, Charlene, I see your hand up there. So if you wanna go ahead and unmute yourself, you can ask Tim your question. I'm interested in the design of used today wondering how many of them are near duplications of what we had in yesteryear, or are they more modernized? I'm sorry, I didn't get your question. <laughs> oh, I'm asking about the sardine can uh, labels. Are, oh, yeah. they, are they the same as they were in the yesteryear, or have they been modernized? I'm not a sardines eater, so I don't know. Well, they have been modernized. For sure, there was a company in San Francisco called the Schmidt Company, and they uh, had artists who did all those labels. They were from Canada all over California, and uh, they were really good artists, actually, did that kind of work. And um, But you go to the Safeway today and look at labels, and they, they still sort of take on that same kind of look to them, uh, but a little bit differently, yeah. All right, fantastic. Um, are there any other questions from the from the group? I have a couple myself. Okay, Harriet, I see you've got your hand up. Do you wanna uh, go ahead and unmute yourself? Sure, a uh, couple of questions. That was extraordinary. <clears throat> I wanted to ask, did you say that the Sicilians took the idea of the nets from the Algerians? From, no, it from, really wasn't. <laughs> they didn't really originate it. It was coming from another culture. That's right. So That's they, came, they got the idea of that schooling. At, yeah, from they would sail across into Tunisia, and those fishermen were using those type of nets here. Uh huh. And um, there was one other question, but um, what were the other biologists doing there? Uh, similar work or yeah, so what? fishing game. Game came down to Monterey. Well, they actually in Monterey in the 19th century. Uh, they opened their offices uh, at Hopkins Marine Station initially in 1919. Uh, a little bit earlier, than that, they opened up Hopkins in 1919, mainly to monitor the Monterey sardine fishery. That's why they were here. And they would go into the canneries every morning and they would meet the fishermen and they kept records because how many fish they're catching, where they're catching them. They also took samples of these sardines back to their office at Hopkins where they'd weigh them and measure them and sex them. And then they actually take the sardines back to the cannery so they wouldn't lose any fish. And the result of this, because there was no sardine season uh, until after 1929. So prior to 1929, they just fished sardines whenever they appeared in the bay, which is usually about the middle of the summer months. In Monterey, the sardine season would go from August 1st to February 15th. And then Southern California went from October all the way into April. Uh, that's 
Uh, but they also did other work too and looked at all the other fisheries, but their main work initially was to monitor the sardine fisheries. And Frances Clark, by the way, as I mentioned, uh, she was way ahead of her time. So she was the first person uh, within fishing game, male or female, uh, to receive a PhD, which she got in 1925. And so at that time, fishing game said, well, what do we do with her? And so they made her a librarian. Uh, and, but then she wanted to run all the sighting programs that fishing game did in California. Uh, uh, she was really a remarkable person. Thank you. Jim? Yeah. Um, so what happened to the Chinese fishermen then? So Chinese fishermen, as you know, uh, Chinese fishermen uh, who fished, which very began to, Chinese fishermen were fishing for uh, pretty much everything out in the bay. But once the railroad arrived in 1874, uh, the railroad changes everything, right? Because now you got a way to get fresh fish to be marketed in San Francisco. Now you got other folks coming to fish in Monterey, in particular the Italians, not the Sicilians yet, but the Genovese coming across the bay from Santa Cruz, coming down from San Francisco to fish primarily for rock fish. The Chinese had learned years before that squid are nocturnal. You burn little pits fire to the side of your boat and just attract them to the surface. And they scoop up these big baskets and bring them onto the beach near their village to dry. And so they began to fish for squid at night because nobody wanted squid then. Squid was considered to be a junk fish. So the Italians are home sleeping. The Chinese are out fishing for squid. Then when the Sicilians arrived out there in 1906, and they're only fishing sardine, uh, and they were really, and the Japanese were fishing salmon. The uh, Sicilians said, we got to fish for something else. And so they sort of pushed the Chinese off the waters and began to fish for squid, although they didn't want it. But they fished that squid and sold it back to the Chinese, in particular, Wan Yi was one of those guys who was buying that dried squid. So uh, Wan Yi uh, was the model for Li Chong, as I mentioned, who immigrated to Monterey in 1919, opened up a little German store, uh, that's across from the aquarium today. They catered to manage the cannery workers, uh, and you name it, he sold everything in there, including rubber boots and rubber aprons. And, and uh, also a rooming house upstairs also catered to that mainly those cannery workers. They also had gambling parlor up there and all kinds of different things. Um, uh, but, he, but he really made his big money in the squid business. And the name of that market, by the way, was Wing Chong Market, and you still have that sign down there, you'll see it. Uh, it's not the original sign. Uh, but and I, I, I've been told by a number of different people uh, for different versions of what that means in, in Cantonese. But it, roughly, it means beautiful, prosperous. Is what it means when it translates to Wing Chong. And, and the name of his squid business was Wing Chong. And, and, and he, he was drying all the squid, and, and they were shipping it to China, to Asia, uh, uh, to Japan, and to, and to Hong Kong. And, and, and to give you an idea of how well he was doing in that dried squid business, in 1930, he, during the Depression, he was making well over $30,000 a year in the dried squid business. So it was definitely beautiful, prosperous for Mr. Yi. Thank you. That's so interesting. There were questions in the chat to where exactly was squid located? So where was that photo taken? Oh, the squid drying grounds? Yeah. Yeah, so, so if you know Monterey, those are taken out on Salinas Highway across the Monterey Airport, those fields that are still empty that we call Tarpy Flat. There are three large Chinese squid drying grounds out there at one time, and uh, Wan Yi had the largest of those squid drying grounds. So at the turn of the 20th century, the city of Monterey banned the drying of squid within the city limits. Now, it's partly a racial thing. Uh, but it's also partly, uh, have you ever smelled dried squid? I mean, a lot of it, it, it has a pretty strong odor to it. And people would, would complain even when it was way out there, past beyond city limits, about the smell of it. Really interesting, thanks. Um, anyone else in the, in the attendees have any questions? You can go ahead and unmute yourself if you've got a question to ask. There was one more question that came through the chat, Tim. The, the label that you showed said San Francisco instead of Monterey. Right. Um, right. When did they start actually putting Monterey on the label? They also said great presentation, love the photos. So that, uh, those ones that say San Francisco, those are from the Booth Cannery. Uh, 
So Bruce Cannery uh, had, his main offices were in San Francisco. So that's why it says San Francisco on there. But he had a cannery in Monterey. He had a cannery in Pittsburgh, California. Uh, and he also had offices in San Francisco. So he was, uh, he was all over the place. He actually retired in 1939 and then died in 1940. The city of Monterey turned the, uh, uh, tore the cannery down in 1941. So the foundations are actually still there uh, uh, where that county was right next to the Monterey Warp. And so I, so I, I always tell people when I do that, that, that I think there should be like uh, an interpretive panel there because that's what really started right there. Don't you think? It's really an important place. So everybody's homework is to write a letter to the city of Monterey demanding that they put a nice interpretive panel down there with the booth starting cannery. How important that is historically to the city of Monterey. That's my political thing. That is great. That's a good question. And, um, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Harriet. You know everything. So how did they get rid of that stench that, that must cover them day to day to day? I can't <laughs> even imagine. So was did they have something that they or they just all smell terrible all the time? I can't well, imagine. depending on where you work. So, you know, if you worked in the cannery itself, you know, you're working with fresh fish, so there really wasn't a bad smell. The odor actually comes from the reduction process, where they're baking all that they would they would uh, ground that fish up in the bone meal and the guts and everything else, and it's baked, and that's where the smell for cannery oil comes from. Uh, and so they, you know, and those guys who worked in a reduction plant, and they were only took us less than ten people could work in a reduction plant, so they took a number of baths, but they they get rid of that smell. I actually interviewed guys, the guy who worked at the uh, at the whaling station in Moss Landing in, in the 1920s. Uh, and, uh, and he said, working in a, in a whaling station where the whale smell was so bad, he said, no, no how many baths you took, you went to the movies, everybody knew where you worked. And Ed Ricketts, by the way, used to go to that whaling station uh, in Moss Landing when he first came to Monterey to collect uh, barnacles from the that would grow on the gray whale, and he would and he would come home and, he, and at that time he was married and lived in Pacific Grove, and he would smell so bad that his wife made him take off his clothes and bury him in the backyard. <laughs> Another question just came in the chat box. So, what were they doing with the material that came from the reduction plant? Did they sell it? To whom were they selling those materials? Well, again, all that reduction stuff was going into animal feed, fertilizer, and chicken feed. That was where the big money was. That was the market for it. And the fish and game tried to control that, uh, but it was really difficult to control. And I won't go into the whole history of that. It will be here till tomorrow. But it was, it's, a, it's a very interesting history. <laughs> go ahead, Jerry. Um, in your description, um, when you first opened up and described the uh, the cannery workers uh, coming out of the homes and coming down the hill. That is uh, so much of what I remember because my mother worked in the canneries also. And, right. uh, and uh, in, in the dark, uh, she would uh, you know, be getting ready. And uh, luckily, sometimes the four lady, Pearl Perry, would come to pick her up in a car and bring her down to work. And when she came home, her hands were uh, so cold and uh, um, getting almost arthritic. Uh, she oftentimes would have, uh, um, well, later on uh, when she worked in our, our company, uh, we had a, a fish market on the wharf uh, in Monterey called Regal Seafood and she would come home with uh, a fish scales on her and all. And just recently, um, uh, Joe Panizzi's, um daughter, Elizabeth, um, posted a, a, a picture on my Facebook page uh, because their company uh, took down their sign, uh, the Royal Seafood sign. They had bought my family's company back in the 70s. And uh, lo and behold, my family's um, sign is still on the building right now. So surprising. Uh, so if you go down to the wharf number two and you uh, look on the side um, that faces the Presidio, you'll still see part of the Regal Seafood sign. I had to dash down there and take a picture because um, that shows the, um, the history of Chinese still, uh, um, still stands uh, in Monterey. That's right. 
And so and that's what brings the point. So so all these workers on the cannery, for the majority of them anyway, lived up above Cannery Row in New Monterey. And so the whole neighborhood is off there were all built for these cannery workers. And sardines were fished at night. Initially the sardines were at the turn of the 20th century, they were actually fished in the daytime. And the fishermen would go out and they said they would listen for this flip in the water that schooling fish would make. And then they knew they were out there and they'd catch sardine. Then they learned that sardine are nocturnal and feed off this false phosphorescent animal and began to fish sardine at night at the dark of the moon. And boats would come in early in the morning. Canners all had their own methods to get their workers. They all had whistles. There were different whistles for different jobs in the canneries. As soon as you heard your whistle, you drop whatever you're doing. And usually you would be sleeping. And if you had small children, hopefully an elderly parent or a neighbor that did not work in the canneries, Otherwise, those kids would fend for themselves. You come down the canneries to work those 10, 12 hour days. There was a point during the depression because there was a big demand for this product that the city of Monterey and the cannery owners worked together and built a daycare center uh, very close to those canneries for those workers. And anybody in Monterey that went to Bayview School that school was built for those cannery children. That's what that school is there. And I actually interviewed a number of children who are not children anymore, who went, whose parents worked in the canneries and went to school there. And they, they could stand on the, on the playground and look out of the bay and they could see all the boats. And they could see how low the boats were in the water. And if they were really low in the water, they knew that mom and dad would not be home until late and they could stand outside a lot longer. Thanks, Tim. Another question came in the chat. Um, you had kind of alluded to an interesting history of uh, Mr. Hoofden. Can you elaborate on that at all? Hoofden? Yeah. Sure, sure. So Newt Hoofden uh, was an interesting guy. So he was Norwegian uh, and he uh, went, was well, not an ichthyologist. A lot of people think he was a scientist. He was not. He did go to a fishery school where he learned how to work in a cannery in Norway. And he, out, of, out of that school, he did go to work for a, a cannery in, in Norway that was smoking herring. And he was in charge of the, of the room that smoked all the herrings. And to smoke herring, you have to have a little fire to create the smoke. Well, one night after a day's work, there was a fire in that cannery that burned that cannery down. And then there was a lot of wind, unfortunately, that night in that town that, that then pushed the fire into the town that burned the entire town down. About 800 houses all burned down. So the fire department determined that the fire started at Hoveden Station. So within two weeks, it was on a ship to the United States ended up initially in Chicago, where, he, uh, uh, where there's a Booth cannery, uh, Booth fisheries in Chicago. I believe they're still there today. And they distribute uh, fresh uh, fish to markets within the Midwest. They told him that their, their nephew, uh, um, uh, Booth, who was in California, go to California. So he came to California and Booth hired him to manage his Monterey cannery in 1906. He just opened that cannery and he came down to Monterey. And he managed that cannery until 1916, when World War One started. And he saw the demand for sardines. He knew there was a money to be made here. And so he breaks away from Booth. And, 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 he, and he also, because he was really interested in getting more and more into the reduction business. And Booth was really leery of the whole reduction thing because he was concerned it was too easy and would deplete the fishery too quickly although he eventually got into it, but Hoveden was really leery, of, or Booth was really leery of it. Hoveden was gung-ho, and he goes down to, into the county row, leases that piece of property, actually buys that property, uh, borrows some money from a guy named T.A. Work, who was a local businessman and banker, and builds his cannery right there. Uh, now, he was an interesting man, as I mentioned, uh, and he did very well in that business. He had canneries in San Diego, he had canneries in Mexico, uh, but when the fishery begins to collapse in, in the early 1950s, and it collapses for a lot of different reasons that I will not go into again today, uh, and overfishing plays a small role in this, actually. Um, he owes a lot of money, in particular, owes a lot of money uh, to the IRS. So he decides to sell the business, but he wants to retain ownership of the property. Uh, so he finds a couple of guys willing to buy the business. He wants $100,000, and he wants it in in cash, cash money, because if they write him a check, he takes that check to the bank, the bank reports that to the IRS. So the new owners go to the bank, withdraw the $100,000, hand it over to Mr. Hoveden, 
This is a true story. Mr. Hovind takes it into the cannery, cans all of that money, seals up the cans, loads up into his car, drives down to Mexico, where he dies in Mexico in the early 1960s. So if you know anything about the sardine fisheries, uh, they have a tendency to run in cycles and they will disappear. And when the California sardine fishery disappears in the 1950s, another fishery in, in Peru and South America began to develop, uh, particularly in Peru. And, uh, and uh, I was giving a walking tour once uh, near the Hoden County and I told the story to a, a couple who were on my tour about Mr. Hoden. Well, it turns out uh, that this couple uh, were, were from Peru. And the young man looked at me and said, you know, when I was a boy, my grandfather used to tell me the story of this Norwegian who showed up in Peru with all this money. I think it was Newt Hoden who <laughs> showed up in Peru with all that money. We don't know. Probably will never know that. That's a great story. Thanks for sharing, Tim. Um, are there any other questions from the, from the group out there? Feel free to unmute yourself if I'm missing you. All right, well, Tim, I just wanted to thank you again. You are, okay. really have a wealth, of, a wealth of information and it's just been wonderful to hear these stories and see the pictures there. I see people applauding. There've been a lot, of, um, a lot of positive comments coming through the chat box. So thanks so much for sharing this. And it really provides a nice context um, for the, the history of the book too. So just fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it very much. Anybody has any, any more questions you think about later, please feel free to email me at timsardine at yahoo.com. Fantastic. And I hope you all are enjoying these talks as much as I am. Um, we are going to be having another one um, next Thursday at the same time. Um, and I think, oh, here we go. We've got the schedule for the event. So next Thursday on the 24th at 2 p.m., um, we'll be talking about natural and cult cultural history of Cannery Row um, with Greg Caillou and Susan Schillinglaw. Um, so just a reminder too, if you don't already have a copy of um, Cannery Row, you can um, check copies out from the Monterey Public Library. Um, and you can uh, sign up for, for future events in the speaker series and in the film series on the Monterey website. Um, so thanks again to Tim. Thanks to the Monterey Library for hosting this. And thanks to all of the attendees um, for being here and for your wonderful questions too. Thank you.